Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Young, Gifted, and Wild About Birds. I'm Tom Anderson, Connecticut Audubon's Communications Director. I'm doing the intro tonight because of the topic, the grassland birds of Fresh Hills Park on Staten Island. I'm a Staten Islander, born and raised, and I remember well when Fresh Hills was an active and huge garbage dump. At its peak, it took in 29,000 tons of trash a day. Fresh Kills itself is actually a river. It's the only river that begins and ends in New York City. The coastal landscape around the river, including vast tidal marshes, was what became the dump. Uh, once, at the start of my career, I actually organized the boat tour up Fresh Kills so the New York State's Assembly's Environment Committee could get a look at its enormity. Uh, that was 40 years ago. It was like a boat ride into a dystopian hell. The difference between then and now is stark, which brings us to tonight's Young, Gifted, and Wild About Birds presenters, Shannon Curley, PhD, and Jose Ramirez Garofalo, who's working on his PhD. Fresh Kills Park includes a thousand acres of grasslands. Shannon and Jose have been studying its birds for half a dozen years. Amazingly, because this is after all New York City, they include 300 nesting pairs of savanna sparrows, 80 pairs of grasshopper sparrows, and even eight pairs of sedge wrens. Shannon and Jose are gonna tell us about it and about how it relates to Connecticut where grasshopper, sparrow, and sedge wren are rarities. So onto the show. Um, as always, we recommend that you use speaker view. Closed captioning is available if you'd like to use that. Maybe most importantly, use the chat function to ask questions. Patrick Cummins, our executive director, will hop on later to participate in the Q&A. So now let's bring on Shannon Curley and Jose Ramirez Garofalo. Shannon has a PhD in biology from the CUNY Graduate Center. She works for the Fresh Kills Park Alliance as a researcher, and she's an adjunct professor at the College of Staten Island. Jose is a PhD student at Rutgers. He's a research associate for the Fresh Kills Park Alliance, and he's also an adjunct professor at the College of Staten Island. So Shannon and Jose, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, let me just share my screen here. And I'm assuming everybody can see the screen. Yeah. yeah. So thank you all so much for attending our talk. We're really excited to be part of uh, CT Audubon's Young, Gifted, and Wild About Birds series this year. And we're very excited about sharing our research and what we're doing at Fresh Kills Park um, which was formerly a landfill, which has now been converted um, and reclaimed into, into this beautiful urban green space. So before we start talking about our research, I thought we'd give a little bit of history about the park, if you'd like to do that, Jose, or about the landfill. So Fresh Hills Park uh, was, Fresh Hills Landfill, was established in 1948 when New York City decided to uh, fill in the vast tidal creeks and wetlands on the West Shore of Staten Island uh, to take in New York City's municipal garbage. Um, as many as 29,000 tons of trash were taken in every day um, via barges and on uh, New York City Department of Sanitation uh, garbage trucks. Um, and throughout the um, years, we had four active landfill mounds, uh, which we'll see uh, in the later slide. Um, and by 1950, or I think it was about 1954, Fresh Kills Landfill was the largest landfill in the world. Um, by 1991, Fresh Kills was New York City's only operating landfill. There are several others in the other boroughs uh, that were receiving residential garbage. Which you can see in this image here to the right, which is a very stark difference from our title page. So in 1996, the New York State Legislature uh, passed a bill requiring that Fresh Kills cease operations uh, by December 31st, 2001. Um, and so that began the process of converting uh, Fresh Kills landfill into something else that wasn't to be determined until a few years later. Um, and by 1997, two of the four main landfill mounds were capped, and those are the North and the South mounds. Um, and by March 22nd, 2001, uh, the landfill received its last barge of garbage. Um, unfortunately, by September 2001, um, after the World Trade Center attacks, um, the governor uh, forced Fresh Hills Park to reopen. 
um, to receive the materials from the World Trade Center site. Um, that became the West Mound that we see today on the bottom left of the photo on the right. Um, and this was um, essentially where uh, you had the New York City Police Department, uh, the FDNY, the medical examiner's office sorting through uh, the debris um, to find uh, human remains as well as, as other um, pieces of evidence from the attacks. So what is Fresh Kills now? Well, Fresh Kills Park um, sits atop the former Fresh Kills landfill, which as Jose mentioned, was closed in 2001. And at the time of its closure, it was actually the largest landfill in the world. Uh, currently it's at 2,200 acres, which makes it about three times the size of Central Park. So this is a very, very big green space that we have. It's currently maintained by the New York State Department, or sorry, New York Department of Sanitation and overseen by the DEC. And it's actually a quite amazing engineering feat. Uh, you can see in the bottom corner here, kind of what this capping process looks like in, in terms of, of creating this green space. So our mounds are sealed and capped with layers of soil and geotextiles. So we have the waste layer here, the former landfill. We have a soil barrier. We also have a gas ventilation layer. Think about as, as uh, garbage is decaying, it's producing different types of gas. We have a drainage layer and then a protective soil material barrier as well. Atop of that is planting soil and seeded with, depending on where you are in the park, um, a native seed mix. And then you can see, and you'll see in other pictures that we share, um, dispersed throughout the park are these kind of wellheads, and this is where gases are checked and collected and ultimately shipped off. So just to orient ourselves a little bit about Fresh Kills Park, it underwent uh, several different phases and we're still actively going through these phases of reclaiming this land. So the south part of the park, South Mound was capped, as you can see in red, in 1996, followed by North Mound, which was capped in 1997. And then the two larger mounds, East Mound, uh, which you see highlighted here, is actually where we get the majority of our breeding grassland birds. And we're going to talk about those reasons or why we think those reasons are happening in a couple slides from now. And then lastly, over the last couple of years, Jose and I got to watch this from afar, this process capping on um, the West Mount, which is actually the largest part of the park. And we're anxious to see what birds start inhabiting that in the coming years. So just to, again, orient ourselves from North, South, East, and West, North Park, um, is this part of the park where we see this really incredible skyline view. And you can see a red-winged blackbird sitting a perch on top of one of the wellheads here. Below that is South Mound. So these are the two smaller mounds. We don't get a crazy amount of, of grassland birds breeding here. East Mound is where we see the majority of our grassland breeding birds. And you can see that that habitat and terrain is a little bit more different. It's large, it's contiguous, um, relatively flat and grasses as far as the eye can see. And then lastly, we have West Mound. That was taken in, I believe, October of last year. So you can actually see on the right-hand side of that there, the finishing of the capping process. So it's really quite remarkable. So the other reason why we're here is to talk about, well, why do we study birds and why is this important? Well, we know that birds are highly dispersive. They respond to climate change. They respond to land use change. And because of that, they're considered ecological indicators, uh, particularly of habitat quality. And one example is we're seeing this reestablishment of pileated woodpeckers right here in NYC uh, and on Staten Island, which is great. And if we study these birds and the changes in the bird communities over time, it helps us develop um, these management and, and conservation practices that we can use long-term. And in our case, an urban reclaimed green space is very important because seeing this wildlife return is being used as a measure of success for us. So we have several research projects that Jose and I and um, different groups of, of students and researchers do. First and foremost is our grassland bird surveys, but we also do bird banding projects uh, to look at territory use and productivity of our birds. Um, and also SEDREM monitoring. And I'll let Jose talk about the other projects because we have some big things coming up this year as well. Um, so in, in the, starting this year, um, we're going to be um, on top of our bird banding operations. 
Um, we're going to be putting out um, radio tags on uh, three species of our grassland birds. So our, our grasshopper sparrows, our savanna sparrows, uh, and our sedrens, which should be the first study of uh, first radio telemetry study of sedrens um, that we know of. Um, and we're also going to start um, banding our fossil terns, which nest in the marshes uh, of Fresh Hills Park. Um, so the, those the marshes that are were, are um, the only essentially remaining uh, natural part of the park. Um, and then uh, hopefully by the fall, we'll be banding northern sawwood owls in our um, our our, uh, our wooded swamp, uh, which is uh, an area that we do get quite a few of, of them during migration. Um, and kind of our other biggest project that we've been working on uh, over the last two years, which is an arthropod inventory, which is the first in New York City uh, in almost 100 years, uh, the first uh, large scale uh, survey. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but we're essentially looking at the differences in the community composition between the different mounds, um, looking at uh, both the, the grassland uh, composition, so whether it's native or invasive, uh, as well as the arthropod uh, communities. So Staten Island actually has a really storied history uh, in terms of grassland birds. It's actually where Alexander Wilson uh, found the largest concentrations of grasshopper sparrows on the eastern seaboard uh, when he was here in the 1800s. Um, historically, species like uh, eastern meadowlark, bobolink, uh, sedrens, grasshopper sparrows, vesper sparrows, and a couple other species that aren't listed nested on Staten Island. Um, unfortunately, over the last hundred years, as Staten Island has become more developed and urbanized, uh, we lost most of those species. Um, and before I move on to the Fresh Hills part, um, over the last about 10 years, we have actually seen uh, a return of some of the species like Easter Meadowlark during the winter. Um, that was a species that we lost um, totally uh, by 2010, uh, just following the second New York State Breeding Bird Atlas, as well as Bobolink. Um, so they start, you know, they're, they're here during migration. Um, Meadowlark were pretty rare during the winter, but all of that has changed in the last six or seven years. Um, so now at Fresh Kills Park, um, we have really large numbers of savanna sparrows. They're by far the most abundant breeding bird at the park, uh, breeding grassland birds, so uh, not, not red-winged blackbird. Uh, but they are by far the most abundant uh, of the grassland birds that we have. Um, the first breeding pair, I think, was probably only found in 2006 or so. It, they're pretty recent uh, colonists to our park, although they've bred on Staten Island since the 1970s. Um, and in 2015, uh, one of our former graduate advisors, uh, Dick Veet, found the first uh, pair of grasshopper sparrows uh, at Fresh Kills. Um, and about a week after finding the first pair, uh, it was joined by about 30 more. Um, and since then, we've had species like Easter Meadowlark, Bobolink, and Cedron breeding at Fresh Kills consistently. Um, so at a regional scale, um, you can see on the, on the left-hand side, we have a, a, a small table with uh, the species of grassland birds that we have, as well as their New York and, and Connecticut status. Um, you can see some differences right off the bat. So species like Hensel Sparrow were threatened in New York State, but they're only special concern in Connecticut, um, as well as species like Easter Meadowlark, which are critically imperiled globally. Um, they don't have status in New York State, but they're threatened in Connecticut. Um, and this kind of goes to show that you can have neighboring states that have very different management policies. Um, it has to do with a, a lot of different factors. Um, in New York State, we do have some grassland conservation measures on agricultural lands that allow species like Easter Meadowlark to breed pretty successfully where they are. Um, but then on the right-hand side, you can see our two you know, major species that we have at Fresh Hills Park in Connecticut, um, where you have savanna sparrows that have only been confirmed in, it seems like a few of those blocks. Um, whereas in New York State, they're you know, pretty widespread and abundant breeders. Um, and then in, in, for grasshopper sparrow, they're pretty few and far between everywhere uh, in Connecticut. But we do have a pretty sizable population in New York, um, of which our population at Fresh Kills is uh, probably the largest and probably one of the largest in the Northeast. So one of the things that we do, one of our major responsibilities is conducting our grassland surveys. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side here um, essentially is what these surveys look like. 
uh, we conduct three minute point count surveys um, at evenly dispersed uh, points throughout the park. So you can see this is East Mound here. This is where we do primarily most of our research. Um, so through May through August, we regularly conduct these point counts on the East Mound with the focal species being Savannah Sparrow and Grasshopper Sparrow. Um, and what you're seeing is the size of that, that dot is relative to the number of birds that we've saw or heard. Uh, typically we hear them before we see them. Um, and then we do have to do these surveys a little bit later now because we had an unexpected visitor that, that stayed to breed or visitors, I should, I should say, um, Cedron, which arrived much later in the breeding season, but we're gonna talk about that as well. But it's important that we conduct these surveys regularly so that we get an idea of the abundance of the birds in the park. And we do this over the years. And you can see the two figures here. We have number of pairs on the y-axis and then the years. Uh, and we have savanna sparrow on the left and grasshopper sparrows on the right. And what you could see is that um, we had a peak in 2017 in the number of savanna sparrow uh, pairs that we had. But for some reason in 2018, we're not quite sure why, we did have this major decline. But it's been rebounding, as you can see, over the next couple of years. A uh, grasshopper sparrow, again, arrived in 2015. Uh, we had lower numbers in 2016, and we've seen a steady increase over the last couple of years. Uh, last year was our highest count of 82 pairs of grasshopper sparrows, which was just incredible. We also are looking at nest productivity when we can actually find these nests. So what you're looking at here is um, savannah sparrow nest. Um, when we find the eggs, one's actually pipping in this picture here. And returning a couple days later to see we have some nestlings here um, in, in that picture on the right. And trying to find these nests is actually very challenging. You can imagine by this point in the summer, the grasses are about five feet tall, four to five feet tall. Um, and these, these nests are typically the size of a small fist. So finding these, these birds among the grasses is, is pretty challenging. But what we're trying to do is, is look at and try to determine the number of birds that are fledging from these nests to get an idea of how well our birds are doing in the park. And then I'll let Jose talk about our bird bedding research. So probably our most, and, and the reason why we're actually involved in Fresh Kills in the first place, um, and probably the most important research that we do at the park um, is, is our bird banding operations. Um, so in North America, bird banding was established in 1920 by the US Geological Survey. And essentially what it allows us to do is systematically collect data uh, for management purpose on North American birds. Um, and that's done by equipping each bird with an individually marked uh, aluminum band. Um, or in our case, we also band with color bands. Um, you'll see in the next slide. Um, and so that allows us to track individuals over time and space. It allows us to get uh, estimates of um, how old a bird, like, you know, the maximum uh, age a bird can be, um, you know, what's the longest lived bird, where do they go, how far do they disperse, and that's actually something that Shannon and I study um, academically. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and so basically what we do is we erect these um, and you can sort of you can see the sort of see the mist net in this picture, but we erect these nets um, that are made of a fine gauge uh, polyester or nylon uh, material, um, and we hope that the birds can't see them. Um, they're black, so it is it is kind of hard to see unless it's windy, which uh, in the grassland that happens a lot because you don't have any trees to to muffle the wind. Um, you know, typically you see um, mist net setups in you know, like wooded areas, but in our case, we are in the wide open. Um, and so we capture the birds in the mist nets and we collect uh, information, obviously the species, but we're also looking at specifically the age of the bird, um, which we are um, essentially looking at like the feather condition. We're looking at um, if the bird is molting. Um, and then we take stuff down like the mass, the wing length, um, and the feather condition, which is really important and tells us if uh, our birds are, are doing well at our site basically. And one thing I just want to point out about our mist net setup is because we are on, um, because the land is capped beneath us, we're actually not allowed to puncture the soil even though uh, the debris level is, is far below us. So we use uh, buckets filled with cement to hold our mist nets up, um, which is a little bit different of a setup. Um, so, and, oh, oh go go ahead. Ahead. No, you're good. Oh. <laughs> 
Do you want me to do this slide? You go. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> um, so what are we learning about, you know, about bird banding and what is this telling us? Um, the first thing it's telling us is that grassland birds are super hard to catch. Um, a lot of times they post, they, they perch on the, the actual net rather than going into the net and just kind of stare at us from afar. Um, and also our nets are, you know, only 12 meters in length. So you can imagine covering all this space, it's, it's kind of a hit or miss. And it's usually a, a miss when it comes to, to banding birds. It's, it's we, when we get lucky, we get lucky. Um, we're getting an idea of productivity. Uh, a lot of the birds that we banned, especially at the end of the summer, we're getting a lot of hatchier birds. And that gives us an idea of how well the birds are doing within the park. And what you can see on, um, on this bird here is we actually mark them with color bands. That's a unique combination that we can track individuals and where they're moving and how they're, and how they're moving throughout the park. And what's really interesting and what we're finding about our birds is that they exhibit high Fidelity, meaning that birds that we banned one year are coming back almost to the same exact spot, right, Jose? Within a, a couple of meters, yeah. we, we so, recapture birds. Yeah, and that, that bird on the left, uh, that was actually one of the first grasshopper sparrows that we banded in 2019. Um, as we actually banded it as a hatchier bird. So it was a bird that was only born, you know, maybe a month before we banded it, um, or actually probably even less than that. Um, and it actually nested in the same exact spot that it was born in. So its parent had actually left that spot and the young had came, had actually came back and nested in the exact same spot. Um, and now we've, we've seen that bird, uh, so now two, three years in a row, um, as well as a couple other birds that we've, we actually banded in 2019 that we've seen um, that have remained on site. And one of the things I want to mention with the color bands um, is it helps us identify individuals from afar. We actually don't ever have to recapture these birds. We can see them with binoculars or with the scope if they're, if they're singing and staying still for long enough. So the color banding is a really useful tool for us to, to study the birds throughout the season. And other things that we're learning is, is um, these territories are actually held for a significant amount of time. So almost throughout the, the breeding season, other studies have shown um, there's a bit of a turnover with territory holders with grasshopper sparrows, but we're finding our sparrows establish their territory and they stay for long periods of time. You can see this image here is actually one of our color banded birds that we followed throughout the season last year. We're still, with the research that we're doing, uh, particularly with the radio telemetry, is we're going to get a better idea of territory size um, and also a better idea of territory density. And we want to know this information because we want to see how our birds compare to maybe more natural uh, types of grasslands um, as a metric of success as well. So we want to be able to have that comparison of, of both territory size and density as well as productivity over the years to make these comparisons. So this is kind of our, our crown jewel for the last two years. And of course we thought that grasshopper sparrows were as good as it gets, or maybe like maybe upland sandpipers would actually, maybe that's, that's my personal favorite, but uh, the sedrens, which are a New York state threatened species, um, they are really, really specialized species. They require moist to wet meadows, grasslands are um, essentially marsh fringes to breed. Um, and their arrival to their nesting areas is generally uh, accompanied when the grasses are the tallest. Um, and so when we say wet grasslands, we really mean that they're poorly drained. And that is something that Fresh Hills, essentially, especially the East Mound certainly is uh, because of its flatness. And, I, and we, there's no photos of it, but essentially the reason why they're poorly drained is because um, the grasslands are actually dipped into, um, it's rather than being completely flat, um, there's like a five foot drop off. And so it allows all of the water to collect after rains. Um, and so that allows us to get these really weird birds like penzo sparrows, which are also kind of, um, and, and also lacan sparrows, which are kind of obligate to that wet, um, wet grassland type habitat. Um, but sedrens are interesting because they exhibit little to no site fidelity. Um, but our birds have actually returned at least two years in a row uh, to our sites in, in increasing number. Um, and, and 
Sedrons are also iterative breeders, which means they go up to higher latitudes to breed, and then uh, on their southward migration, they stop again to have another, uh, another go at breeding. Um, and unfortunately, because they have such a weird breeding schedule, uh, essentially, they can be really hard to study with things like the Breeding Bird Survey, which have uh, these set routes and set times of the year that we, um, uh, that we survey them. Um, and they also, like other uh, species of wren, like the marsh wren, uh, they build decoy nests. And sedrons, I think, can build up to seven decoy nests. Um, so that makes it really difficult to study them, even when we know exactly where, where they are, essentially. So um, sedrons were formerly pretty widespread throughout the Northeast, um, but they've contracted their range since the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and they breed, especially in New York State, um, and obviously in Connecticut and, and other places, they breed in really low numbers. Um, in New York, their uh, populations are pretty much confined to the northwestern part of the state uh, on the border of Quebec um, and, uh, and, and, and Ontario. Um, their highest densities occur in the Midwest, although we're, I think they've also found pretty recently that in Quebec, they have some pretty high densities um, just north of New York State. Um, that's actually a pretty recent finding within the last uh, 15 or so years. Um, but they are largely extirpated as breeders throughout the Northeast. Um, in New York State, um, so this is actually a figure uh, that Shannon made for our paper um, of breeding, a set of approximate breeding locations uh, of sedrons in New York State um, in 2020. Um, so like I said before, they're, they're threatened in New York State. Um, but in New York City and Long Island, um, where they actually had a, a pretty interesting history. Uh, they were extirpated as breeders in about 1960 when uh, JFK Airport was built on top of uh, the marshes of Idlewild Park where they bred formally. Um, and this is uh, in 2020 when we found them, uh, this was the first documented breeding record in Staten Island since 1943, where again, they bred uh, in, in numbers on the Eastern shore and some points on the Western shore of the island. So as you can imagine, uh, but by August, for most of our grassland birds, uh, the breeding season is winding down. This is where we're getting a lot of fledgling birds. We're getting a lot of hatchier birds that are in the park. Um, and during, on August 6th, during our, a standard um, banding uh, session, myself, Jose, and uh, Dr. Kate Field, we're banding for Cedron and, or sorry, banding for Grasshopper Sparrow. And all of a sudden we hear this song that was very, very unfamiliar to us. And you can imagine when you spend all day, every day in this park, if you hear something new and you hear something singing that you don't immediately recognize, you know you have something pretty cool. Um, and we identified it as a Cedron, which came almost right up to our banding net. It was a very bold little bird. Um, and we hear one bird singing, and then a couple hours later, we hear another bird singing. And then by the end of the day, we had at least four uh, that were singing all at once. And this was just a very cool and interesting um, find for us. So on August 12th, we observed them bringing nesting material. On August 14th, we had three, what we would say three confirmed singing birds, three confirmed territories, all returning to individual nest sites. Um, on September 16th, uh, Jose observed the first fledgling um, by walking actually into the grasses, which I won't do that time of the year because I am four foot 11 and these grasses are almost seven feet tall at that time. Uh, you would lose me forever if I walked in there. Um, but Jose actually observed the fledglings there. And on September 29th, we had at least three juvenile birds present in the park. October 11th of 2020 was the last observation we had of the season. So fast forward to the following year on July 12th, so a significant amount of time earlier, uh, we heard Cedrens singing again, uh, which kind of blew our mind. And this time you could see from this image here on the complete opposite side of the park. So uh, true to their uh, you know, in, in not very good site fidelity, they did pick the opposite side of the park, which is very interesting. But what was even more so is that they returned earlier, but we also had eight pairs in 2021. Uh, much harder to observe, they're in a more difficult part of the park, but it was just very incredible to see two years in a row of these birds come here and breed, um, arrive earlier and, uh, and more pairs uh, later in time. 
So getting into what we're going to be doing this year, um, this is a, a map of the MODIS array. And so the MODIS array, the MODIS network um, is an international collaborative research network of these automated radio telemetry towers um, that allow us to um, learn a lot more about the distribution, migration, and dispersal of birds in general. Um, so essentially what happens is um, we are putting these little uh, very high frequency tags on our birds um, and they ping on a tower when they uh, fly past essentially. And so we can come up with a pretty solid migratory route or dispersal route um, for individual birds. And so, as you can imagine, on a large scale, the more birds that we tag, uh, the better we know uh, of their movements. And so this is the 21st century um, big research uh, question uh, is, you know, where, where are these birds going and, and how fine of a scale can we learn that information? Uh, and the modus array is essentially allowing us to do that. Um, so at Fresh Kills Park, um, we are going to be, uh, we're, we're not actually going to put up a MODIS tower. Um, we're going to have our individual uh, receivers. It's the same thing that goes up on a MODIS tower. Um, and basically what we're going to do is we're going to tag the birds, obviously, but, and you can see that's a, a, there's a species with a, one of the low-tech uh, nano tags. Um, and that's the, the company that makes the brand that we're actually going to buy. Um, so we're going to tag individual birds, and then we're going to walk around with uh, antennas and receivers, and we're going to track them throughout the park. So we're going to have an idea of what they're doing during the breeding season, um, where they're moving to. So there's a lot of movement of birds that you can't track by, uh, by sight, essentially. So especially our cryptic species like the sedron, which are really difficult to observe. Like, you know, we can go days without seeing one, we can hear them, but we'll never see them. Um, but we're also going to learn a lot, hopefully, about when they leave the park. Um, so we're finding that a lot of our grasshopper sparrows actually stay into the fall, so a lot later than people really give them credit for. Um, but we're also going to learn, you know, if our sed trends are, you know, leaving the site earlier, uh, if they're coming uh, later, what they're doing during the breeding season uh, in, in those areas that we can't really see them. Um, so this is very novel research, especially for the, for the Cedron. Um, over the last few years, we've also documented a lot of interesting birds, vagrants, and species that migrate through our area um, that are probably undergoing um, part of the dispersal process where you have information collection. So during, you know, before migration, following migration, following the breeding season, before the breeding season, um, a lot of birds undergo this process by which they're searching for a place to breed in the future or, or during that season. It's kind of a complicated picture. Um, and that is what we would call informed dispersal. Um, and so, or the site prospecting uh, behavior. Um, and so one of the species that we've uh, observed this happening for are uh, upland sandpipers, which have been coming during, uh, right before the breeding season during the spring, um, and also as regular fall migrants. Uh, but we've actually had pairs that have lingered into the breeding season uh, that have yet to breed on the site. Um, and about 12 or so years ago, um, we actually did have a breeding population of upland sandpipers at JFK Airport. Um, and they were literally breeding out on the tarmac in strips of, uh, of grasses. Um, so we would imagine that fresh kills with over a thousand acres of grassland habitat um, could be suitable habitat for them uh, in the near future, if, uh, if, if not this year. But we've also had um, one of my favorite species, uh, the Henslow sparrow, uh, now occur multiple times in the last couple of years, um, in, including one bird in 2019 uh, that we almost caught in the mist net. It was sitting on the, uh, <laughs> it was actually sitting on, on one of the guy lines that was connected to our um, one of the stakes that was in the ground. Uh, and, you know, it was super close. And unfortunately, when we tried to spook it into the net, uh, it flew the other way and we couldn't catch it. Um, but in 2021, um, Shannon uh, heard a singing sedren in our uh, singing uh, Hensel Sparrow in our sedren colony. 
uh, and we found either the same bird or other individuals um, for about three months in that area. Um, so they were probably sticking around, and that means that we could actually have Henslow, Spre uh, Henslow Sparrow breeding in New York City again uh, for the first time since the 1950s. Um, and that would be really, um, it'd be really interesting. Um, but we hypothesized that um, our large population of grasshopper sparrows are essentially being uh, used as an indicator by, uh, by our, hen our Henslow sparrows uh, for um, quality of habitat, essentially. Um, and this is, uh, this is a really new development um, that was pretty exciting and I wish more people could have um, been privy to seeing this bird. Uh, on August 24th, uh, I actually found a male Lacan sparrow singing on a blade of blue stem in our Sedron colony. Uh, and it was just sitting there for a few minutes, just singing. And, um, you know, unfortunately, we didn't get pictures, but uh, it was there. It was there for about 10 minutes singing, and, and we were really excited. Um, at that point in the season, we actually didn't have any grasshopper sparrows singing uh, at all. Uh, so that was kind of an, indica uh, an indication to us, like, oh, that sounds like a grasshopper sparrow. But uh, if you've ever heard a Lacan sparrow singing, it's a slightly higher pitched, uh, slightly different call, um, sounds more like, um, just sounds like a different bird. Uh, and it was singing there and it was really interesting um, that we had our, our one day wonder Lacan sparrows. Um, but Lacan sparrows breed far to the north and west of New York, but have actually been found. Uh, this is the third time that they've been found uh, in suitable habitat during the breeding season in the last 30 years in New York State. Um, so hopefully at some point in the future, um, if they do shift their range southward, which it seems like uh, some species are doing, um, we could potentially have our own population of breeding Lacan sparrows or uh, non-breeding uh, Lacan sparrows. They seem to be increasing in the New York City area during the winter and the late fall. So Unfortunately, we, we do have to talk about uh, things that might be troublesome to our grassland bird populations and also being within, within a city um, as well. So we do have some predators uh, of our grassland birds. So in 2018, red fox uh, began to breed within Fresh Kills Park. Um, by 2020, there are about 10 families. Um, 2021, there are about 20 families, and I expect this number, based on the, the number of dens that Jose and I are finding all over the park, that this number is um, still rapidly increasing, particularly in other parts of the park like West Mound that we, we don't yet have access to, um, which, which is a potential issue for us. Um, this arrival of our red fox has also coincided with declines that we're seeing in nesting success of other birds that historically or, or even just recently uh, were, were nesting in the park. Um, so unfortunately, we're seeing this drastic decline of uh, killdeer and spotted sandpipers. Uh, we used to see fledglings um, quite often and, and we haven't been seeing any. In fact, uh, last year we had zero pairs of, of killdeer that we observed. Um, in 2018, over 30 pairs of both species were nesting uh, within the park and within the mounds, and, and we would see them quite often, but unfortunately, these numbers have drastically, drastically declined um, with this increase of red fox as well. And, and I'm going to pass off the white-tailed deer to Jose because I hate talking about white-tailed deer. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a really contentious issue on Staten Island uh, and probably Long Island and also other places in the Northeast. Uh, on Staten Island, we've had a massive uh, population explosion by white-tailed deer in the last 15 years. Um, and unfortunately, because of that, uh, a lot of our understory um, in our forests on Staten Island um, is gone, or it's been replaced by capri or in Japanese silk grass. Um, and at Fresh Kills, uh, we do have uh, deer that are um, opportunistically predating our birds. And that's a behavior that we've seen uh, elsewhere. And if you've banded birds before, you probably know well, uh, know well about that. Um, uh, but although we haven't um, seen them eat our, um, our grassland birds, we do know that they do predate uh, the nests of ground nesting birds. So um, at some point, this is something that we're hopefully gonna quantify, um, but it's probably gonna have to wait uh, a little bit. We need uh, a pretty sizable number of uh, cameras and, and observers to, to make this happen, um, but it's a goal for the future. What you're seeing in this image here 
um, is a white-tailed buck, uh, white-tailed deer buck that has ear tags on it. This is because um, White Buffalo is is a company that is actually performing vasectomies on the on the males um, in order to uh, prevent them from breeding because the population on Staten Island um, has just they've proliferated and and have really decimated a lot of the understory, like Jose was mentioning. Um, they're, they're also a, a danger as well. They, they cross highways, they get hit by vehicles. Um, so it's really a safety issue when they're all concentrated in this one spot. Um, so this company is monitoring, um, uh, with New York City, is monitoring these populations of deer. It's also wearing a radio collar, solar paneled, uh, solar powered radio collar to track its movements. Um, unfortunately, Deer are actually pretty good swimmers. Can you hear me? I got muted for a yes. second. Yeah. Okay. Um, so even though this program is happening, new, new deer do have the opportunity to swim over and replenish the population, unfortunately. But um, preliminary results are saying that this, this, um, this research endeavor has actually been pretty successful. So which is good for, for Staten Island. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I froze there. And so, so we're gonna deviate a little bit from our, our grass and birds, but we wanted to start this last year, but COVID kind of complicated things a little bit. Um, so this year, we're actually gonna start banding our foster's terns um, that breed in the uh, the marshes at Fresh Kills. Um, Foster's terns reach the northern limit of their breeding range in New York, so in Long Island uh, and parts of New York City. Um, and so we're going to be using uh, these maroon uh, color bands, um, which will allow observers across the city and across the region to track our birds, and we're hoping to um, get a better idea of their habitat use in urban areas, because this is actually something that hasn't been studied in the Northeast. Uh, despite their colonization uh, in the last about 40 years um, on Long Island. Um, so this is going to be the first uh, Foster's Turn specific study in New York State, but I think it's probably uh, one of the first in the Northeast, excluding like Southern New Jersey. And then um, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, so our arthropod sampling, which is uh, kind of, I, has become probably one of my favorite things uh, because I, I apparently really like grasshoppers. Um, arthropods are really important for grassland uh, and, and ecosystem health in general. Um, and in Northeastern North America, we have seen that a lot of these species haven't really been subject to any kind of inventory, uh, despite you know, a really rich nat natural history uh, in, in the Northeast and um, body of literature from pretty much before like 1970, um, you know, you have all this data and then, you know, over the last 50-ish years, you know, we see this decline of uh, natural history observations and data. Um, so we want to add to that and, and essentially what we're doing at Fresh Hills Park is um, we're doing these uh, comparisons between the landfill mounds to look at community diversity. Um, but because we have this really unique habitat, we're starting to see other species that historically weren't present uh, start to establish. And one of the, and two of the species are uh, American bird grasshopper, which on the, the top of uh, the slide you can see that's a nymph uh, American bird grasshopper. It's a southern species that um, historically didn't breed farther than I think like southern Maryland, um, but they are known to be long distance dispersers, actually more of uh, vagrants in, in the Northeast, including in Connecticut. Um, and I guess probably in the last two years, they successfully underwent uh, long distance dispersal and have now um, started to breed in Pennsylvania and in New York uh, at Fresh Kills, as well as another site on Staten Island, um, which is really interesting, as well as the admirable grasshopper, which previously had only been documented breeding uh, on the East Coast as far up to, uh, as far up as, as uh, about central, South Central uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and now they are pretty numerous at Fresh Hills Park. So this is all development over the last couple of years that we're starting to see. Um, and then right below the grass, the bird grasshopper photo, you can see a red leg grasshopper, which are really widespread throughout the Northeast and there are most abundant grasshopper species at the park. 
I do want to point out um, the the coloration of the of the nymph that we see of the American bird grasshopper, um, and this this was actually found. We we were leading a a school group, and the the students actually found this grasshopper, uh, which is which is pretty amazing. Um, this is one of those species that um, its color variation is dependent on the density in which uh, there are other grasshoppers of the same species around it. So in high densities of grasshoppers, the nymphs are actually this red color. Um, so we're finding them at fresh kills. We're, we're finding that, you know, when we find nymphs in this bright red color, we know there's quite a few of them there. Um, but also they overwinter, correct me if I'm wrong, Jose, they, they do overwinter as adults. And we do find adults in the springtime. So hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll start seeing more of them. And just to highlight here, we actually last summer had two high school research interns from the Staten Island Tech, uh, from Staten Island Tech High School. And they did this fantastic job of doing transect surveys to look at um, the diversity of arthropod families between two different parts in the, of the park with the idea that East Mound, where we get a lot of the, the um, really specialized uh, grassland birds, um, is a little bit different from the other part of the park, North Mound, where we don't get the same type of variety and species diversity in the birds. They hypothesize that maybe food abundance and the diversity of insects could be driving this relationship. And it's a really interesting um, project that they've conducted here, what you can see on the left-hand graph at the bottom are different families and colors in red for east and blue for north. And you could see that some of the different families of arthropods that we're finding are shared between the two mounds, but we're also finding, or they're also finding, um, that there are some families that are unique to both the mounds. And that's actually what they're looking at here um, with beta diversity. Um, I won't go into, this is a principal component analysis, but basically red is the North Mound, uh, black is the East Mound, and you're looking at two different groups, uh, two different centroids of the sampling. So the farther apart these dots are from one another, the more different the communities are. Um, so what they're finding is that the two mounds, so even within the same park, they're finding different families and different species completely between the two different mounds. And I just wanted to take a little moment to congratulate them because they just told us that they've reached the finals for their New York City Tarot STEM Fair competition, which was part of this project. So um, we just wanted to congratulate them on that and good luck to them in the finals. I'm sure they'll do great. I just want to take a moment there for them. And lastly, we just wanted to uh, show our website here and different ways you can get involved with Fresh Kills Park. Now Fresh Kills Park is not yet open to the public um, there's a portion of the park that will be open that was off the capped mound uh, sometime in 2022. However, we do offer kayak tours, nature walks, and photography, photography tours within the closed portion of the park. So sign up for our mailing list um, so you can get an idea of when those dates are happening. But we're also happy to take art and research inquiries, uh, which you can, you can look, I'm going to get involved here and submit these inquiries as well. Um, we're happy to host class trips. And also, if there are students out there that are looking for research and have a research question that they want to address, or even if they want to help Jose and I do some of this research, um, we're also open to those opportunities. So we just want to put that out there as well. And then here's a grasshopper sparrow picture that Jose took that I think is fantastic. And with that, we're, we're happy to answer questions. You muted. <laughs> yeah, are you muted, Patrick? <laughs> How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. I have to keep on switch, switching back and forth uh, between my speakers. I mean, between my microphones. Grassland birds are are near and dear to my heart. Uh, uh, when I was growing up, I discovered a a nesting colony of grasshopper sparrows and eastern meadowlarks on this little abandoned lot near a sh shopping center in Manchester, Connecticut. So it was uh, that, that was uh, really what got me interested in, in, in bird conservation. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, 
Jennifer asked, what about the li liquids that are leaking from the mound into the stream and wetland areas? Uh, were they lined before they started creating the mounds? Yeah, so there's actually a, a system of wells and trenches underneath the capped landfill that collects all of the leachate. Um, so when the rainwater forms, it collects that um, and is actually collected and sent to a treatment plant. Cool, thank you. Um, Evan Griswold asked, can the public visit the area? You went, you covered that, I think, well, later in the in the presentation. Um, hopefully, we were talking earlier. Maybe maybe we can find some way to, to have an eco-travel tour down there someday. Uh, that would be really cool. I tell you, I'd love to see those Enzo sparrows. Uh, that, that's for sure. Um, he also asked, is there a problem with the Phragmites uh, communis, uh, the common reed, uh, uh, spreading uh, in there, and, and perhaps how you've dealt with it? Yeah, so that's unfortunately, yes. I, I wouldn't say that we have a, a, a big problem with Phragmites, actually. They, they really stick to the um, the edges of, of the grassland um, where the water pools. Um, so they're not, it's not so much of a problem. It's actually Chinese bush clover. That's a huge problem at Fresh Kills. Um, they have created a, that they've actually created a problem for us. Um, it's a species that has essentially spread um, over the last couple of years across the entirety of the East Mound. Um, and unfortunately, there's not much you could do about it. It's a species that it's, it's really, really difficult to remove. Um, however, our savannah sparrows actually seem to really like it. So that actually might be a factor in, in their sort of recovery over the last couple of years. But um, these uh, grasshopper sparrows seem to kind of avoid it. Um, and the sedrens avoid it like the plague. Um, but uh, American bird grasshoppers love it. <laughs> hmm. Uh, so this is Tom again. Um, I, I was, I'm going to ask a couple of the questions so Patrick can concentrate on, on participating in the conversation. Um, Arthur Shippey um, asked whether it would be useful to have a drone help you survey the birds. Yeah, that, so that was actually a, an idea that was um, spearheaded by a, a colleague of ours from the New York, City, uh, New York State Department of Environmental uh, Conservation, Jason Smith. Um, we were hoping uh, right as COVID started um, to uh, start using a drone to do some um, some surveys. It wasn't going to be um, necessarily visual surveys, but um, we were going to be looking at um, the, uh, the the wildflower uh, wildflower densities um, and potentially also using infrared to look for uh, grassland birds. Um, that was that we were really hoping to do that, but unfortunately. Uh, COVID got in the way. So that, that might be something that we can do in the next couple of years, uh, but def definitely not this year, but in the future, potentially, yeah. Um, here, here's a question actually that um, has been on my mind for a while, and maybe the three of you can sort of um, t uh, bat it around a little bit. Why so many grasshopper sparrows at Fresh Kills and so few in Connecticut? Uh, any, any thoughts on that, Patrick? Yes, I'd say size. Um, there just aren't grasslands of this size here in Connecticut. And when we do get them, they, the grasshopper sparrows do tend to show up. Even in you know somewhat suboptimal habitat types, there's a little spot in Bristol that's on a dog park where there's a couple of pairs of grasshopper sparrows uh, and uh, starting to get over, overgrown with uh, uh, autumn olive, but the, the grasshopper sparrows, sparrows are still persisting there. Um, our biggest populations of grasshopper sparrows, of course, Bradley uh, Airport, where access is difficult. It's a big, that's, that's our biggest area of grassland. And then uh, the Hartford landfill. But there's actually, you know, if you look at the breeding bird atlas, our grasshopper sparrows have increased. That's one of the few species that has, has increased its range in Connecticut um, between the two uh, atlas uh, projects. Um, does it have anything to do with, with um, the site structure, for example, plant composition or soil composition or strictly size? Um, I think size is the most important factor. In some areas in the Northeast, grasshopper sparrows will not be so picky with their habitat. They'll nest on sort of lush hillsides in the New Jersey area, uh, up in North Jersey, up near the Highlands uh, um, uh, State Park. Um, so imagine, you know, it look, looking at the habitat there, it looks like there's a lot of Timothy and, and, and 
more, much more dense than I would say is the habitat that's optimal for grasshoppers, sparrows. But because of the size of it, um, and perhaps because of these populations of grasshopper sparrows that have moved into Jersey, North Jersey area in, in some of this more warm season grassland habitat, uh, they might be a little less picky about their, their habitat types. Here in Connecticut, they seem to be very restricted to well-drained soils and the vegetative communities that come up associated with that. They like to take the dust fast. They like to have some, some sparse areas. Same with the upland sandpipers. Uh, but again, we're right, you know, we're sort of marginal to their range. So they might be a little more picky here at the edge. Mm. Uh, um, Jose and Shannon, I noticed you, you two are sort of nodding. I'm, I'm, is that you're, you, you basically agree with that analysis? Correct. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. I, um, I, I don't necessarily need you to disagree with my boss on, on during the show, but you can tell me later if you disagree. Perfectly acceptable though. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, what it, about, it's spot on, <laughs> it's spot on. Um, one of our members, a uh, fellow named Evan Griswold, um, asked about whether burning can be part of habitat management. And it also raises the longer term question about um, uh, transition from a grassland to a shrubland and, and what kind of management will be necessary there. That is a fantastic question. Um, we can't burn in New York City as a form of management. Um, we, we can't. Um, so what happens is to prevent this ecological succession to this shrubby habitat, fresh kills actually gets mowed every year. And it's quite the endeavor and it's pretty pretty cool to watch, but um, at, at, in the fall every year, the grasslands are completely mowed. Um, all of the mounds are mowed uh, to prevent that woody succession from happening over time. Um, I know in the more natural grasslands, things like natural fires help prevent this process from occurring. Um, but in, and even in other managed grassland sites, but in New York City, especially on top of, of the landfill, it's just not an option for us. Uh, yeah. So mowing it is. <laughs> yeah, there will never be burning on top of the landfill. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. So, so um, one of the folks participating tonight or watching <clears throat> tonight is um, Robert Askins, Professor Emeritus at Connecticut College, who is one of the um, nation's well-known uh, ornithologists. Um, and Bob just messaged me to say he has a question. And if we can get him unmuted, um, yeah. maybe we could just hear from Bob instead of uh, me interpreting what he wants to ask. Uh, I think I am unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Welcome, Bob. Uh, I, I was wondering about the fertility of the soil at Fresh Kills because uh, my impression is a lot of grassland restoration projects are not do not meet their goals because they're done on former farmland, which has been heavily fertilized. And so you have this built up of nutrients over decades and you end up with extremely dense, tall grass that isn't suitable for most grassland species, particularly grasshopper sparrows. So clearly uh, the size of the grassland is critically important, but even large areas may not have these grassland species if, uh, if they're on cornfields that have been fertilized for 50 years. And uh, I assume that fresh kills, uh, the soil was brought in and put on top this protective barrier. Is that very poor soil nutritionally or is it, uh, is it topsoil? So it's actually playground soil. So it's soil, it's, it's, um, I actually don't, you know, we, we are hoping to actually do a study on this. Somebody came out last year to, to actually look at the soil. Um, we're hoping to get results of that study and, and publish it uh, very soon. Um, so this is actually soil that is brought in and used it. It's the same type of soil that's used in other New York City parks. So it's soil that uh, a kid can eat and, and be okay. Uh, essentially. So I don't know that that, I think that means that it's low, low, uh, it would be low nutrient. Essentially. Uh, is the soil layer fairly thin compared to a natural? So yeah, perhaps very, that's a factor as well. Yeah, it's, it's thin. I, how many inches I think, Shannon? It's, it's like six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's only about six inches. So the reason I ask in Europe, a common procedure for grassland restoration is to reduce the nutri nutrient concentration in soils 
Uh, one way is to repeatedly harvest the grass and pay it, move it away. Uh, another method that actually is more successful is they just remove the topsoil. And they've had very good luck in restoring natural grassland. So this seems to be something we haven't really focused on much in North America. But the original grasshopper sparrow habitats in North America were along the coastal plain and sandy soil with low nutrition. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Yep. Thanks a lot for that question, by the way. Thank you. We're big fans. Um, <laughs> Here's a question from um, Carol Doniger on a similar, uh, sort of similar. She, she wanted to know about um, who designed and selected the plantings uh, and are they typical of other grasslands in New York and Connecticut? That is a great question. And it depends in terms of the vegetation and what the plants that were selected. It depends on uh, which mound we're talking about and um, the year it was capped. So for instance, East Mound, which is capped later, is a native seed mix that is used for vegetation for the grasses. Uh, North Mound, I forget the details on North Mountain, Jose. It was, it, this is not, it was not a native seed mix. No, it wasn't. No, south, no it's, uh, North and South Mound were not native. It was East Mound. Not east native. Yep, but, east but later years, they started using the, they started using or implementing the native seed mixes for the two larger mounds. Yeah, so the warm, warm season grasses. Interesting. We, we also have two questions about things that may or may not be leaching or seeping um, or escaping from uh, and the gas from the, um, uh, from the landfill. What, uh, uh, one of the early questions wanted to know if, the, if, the, um, uh, if there's a subsurface lining to, to protect liquids from getting into the waterways. And um, another, uh, someone, um, someone else asked, you mentioned, you mentioned a gas that's being removed from the park and sent somewhere. What type of gas and where does it go? Sorry, the first question was, is well, there- about, a about whether li liquids are leaching um, into the waterways. No, and, and actually, um, so there is an impermeable membrane that does collect that the, the, uh, the water that's filtrating through. Um, which is collected and, and again, uh, sent and shipped off to the treatment plant. Um, so there isn't, we actually do water quality testing on site to look at, um, look at the different bacteria levels within the waterway itself immediately, like it, right next to, right next to these mounds. And uh, the water is actually pretty clean. Um, for, for New York City, it's, it's, it's relatively, um, relatively clean water. So um, that's not to say that when we have heavy rain events in, in a place like Manhattan, of course, you're going to get um, runoff from, from concrete and things like that into the water. So we do see spikes in bacteria on hot summer days after big rain events, but that's not related to the landfill capping process itself. And about, and about the gases that are escaping? Methane. Methane. Yeah, so it's just released into the air. Yeah, and so that that powers the home. Uh, that's that that's the gas of of uh, homes in our area. It's sold back to National Grid. And there's um, so the, the gas, all those wells, the the picture that you, that looked like the little pipe coming up from the grassland itself. Those are all monitored regularly for gas levels. And right now the levels are, I don't know the numbers offhand because I. I it, not something I'm terribly familiar with, but are, are very, very low to the point where they're actually not collecting the gases the way they used to, to ship off. It's actually going and being routed to our flare stations. And every once in a while, we have a couple flare stations on site. Um, very rarely that do they have to use that. So as this decaying process of the debris underground is occurring, it's also slowing down quite significantly, which is producing less gases over time. Well, it's a little past eight o'clock. And uh, uh, even though people are still eagerly asking questions, uh, it's time to, for us to wrap up. Uh, thank you, Shannon and Jose. It was a fascinating uh, presentation. And Fresh Kill sounds like an amazing place. Uh, I hope we can visit you there someday. Uh, uh, that, that would be really cool. Well, I, we're definitely wishing you success in your coming seasons. And, and hopefully you get those breeding and con sparrows and, and henslows, a nice population of henslow sparrows nesting there. So, well, thank you all for being a part of this presentation and for support, supporting Connecticut Audubon's conservation work in Connecticut.
It's Thanks an lot. incredibly exciting time for conservation here in the state and, and nationwide. And, and Connecticut Audubon Society is at the forefront of all of it. Uh, and when I, I talk about our accomplishments as, as an organization, uh, actually, there's a new division of a National Wildlife Refuge uh, this week here in Connecticut, uh, up in Middletown, uh, the Moromis Division of the Conti Refuge. That we, we helped to play a key role in, in protecting that land over the past many years. And I say we help, that means all of you, our members, our supporters, our helpers, you all inspire us, you keep us moving, you allow us to get the work done. And, and, in, and in some cases, uh, 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 you know, roll up your sleeves and, and, and volunteer to help us. So thank you so much. We wouldn't be able to get done a, a, anything done without you. Thank you. Everything that the Connecticut Audubon Society accomplishes, think of it as a personal accomplishment, something that you helped yourself to do as uh, whatever level of support that you're able to give to us. And please, don't forget that there's one more presentation coming up in our Young, Gifted, and Wild series, uh, Wild About Birds series. Uh, Murray Burgess, PhD candidate at North Carolina State University, will be talking about her research into the nesting success of barn swallows. Uh, barn swallows is actually a species we're very interested here in here at Connecticut Audubon Society, in part due to some work that's going on up in Massachusetts, and we're partnering with Mass Audubon and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in a barn swallow aerial insectivore initiative that has started around the Massachusetts area, but we're starting to also uh, do some work down here with nesting barn swallows. Um, the timing is ideal. It's April 21st, the day before Earth Day, and the barn swallows will be just returning to Connecticut. You can sign up at ctaudubon.org slash YGW. And thank you again uh, for everything you do for the Connecticut Audubon Society. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Tom, uh, and everybody who helped to make this possible. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.